Today we'll be considering the span and basis of a vector space and what those are useful for. Let's begin. The span of a finite set v1 to vn of vectors in a vector space v over a field f is a set of vectors defined by the span of that set of vectors being the set of the all possible sums of those vectors where the coefficients on the sums are given by elements of the field. That is, choose any a, j, and f, and then choose a set of n of them, and put them as coefficients on each of your uh, each of your v vectors, all, any n of them. Uh, you can also choose this to be zero, so you can have, you obviously include v1, v2, all the way up to vn by themselves, and all their uh, all vectors parallel to that. We see the span of any finite set of vectors is a linear subspace of v, in the sense that you can add any two elements in this, and you get another element in it, simply by, um, by adding their coefficients. And you can scale them, since you can choose any scalar. So if you scale up your scalars, um, then you can scale up the vectors you constructed in the span. We note that the span of any empty set of vectors is the trivial vector space of just the zero vector by itself. Some set of vectors are said to be linearly dependent if the sum of these equals to zero for some set of aj and f, where aj does not equal zero for at least one of the scalars aj. That is, um, that is consider, uh, so this definition is a little tricky. So for instance, if you consider, if you have two vectors, perhaps uh, v1 and v2, where v2 is twice the length of v1 and is just parallel to it, then you'll note that the sum where you choose two copies, uh, negative two copies of v1 and one copy of v2 will add up to give you zero. So in that sense, they're linear, linearly dependent. And you see that you can also think about that intuitively, that they're linearly dependent because one of them is literally twice the other. It depends on the span of that one vector. Some other uh, courses on linear algebra can get into this a little more detailed. We'll also note an important thing is this is for at least one of the scalars aj. So for instance, if the zero vector is in your span of vector, or in your set of vectors, then you always have linear dependence, because you can always put a non-zero vector on the, uh, a non-zero scalar on the zero vector, and when you add them all up, as long as the other ones are all zero, then you'll get the zero vector. That is, any set including the zero vector will be linearly dependent. You call a set of vectors to be linearly independent if they're not linearly dependent. So we can say that if this sum is equal to zero, the sum of any combination of aj, uh, vj is equal to zero, implies that the aj must be zero for all indices from one to n, um, then they're linearly independent. Um, yes, correct. You can then check that the vectors v1 to vn are linearly dependent if and only if the span from v1 to vn is equal to the span of v1 up to vj minus one, jumping vj and then vj plus one up to vn for some index between one and n. That is, you can have linear dependence if you can remove one and the span is unchanged. Indeed, if these two spans are equal, then vj is an element of the span of v1 and is an element of the span, uh, which is an element of the span of the vn except for the jth element. So vj can be written as a non-zero sum of uh, ai vi. And then you can rearrange that to create a sum uh, of this form where you have non-zero coefficients on each of the terms. This then shows that the set of v1 to vn are linearly dependent. Conversely, suppose that the vectors are linearly dependent, then the sum is equal to zero for some scalars, not all of which are zero. So let the jth one be non-zero, then you can write vj as simply this sum of the negative sum of ai aj inverse, where aj inverse is you can just think about that term as ai over aj. That's why you have it being non-zero. So think about rearranging your sum of, rearranging this sum to solve for vj by itself and then dividing off the aj term and you'll get this sum. So you see that aj is clearly in the span of the rest of the elements, namely in this span. With that, we can actually prove the basis theorem now, which says that if m vectors, w1 up to wn in a vector space v, are contained in the span of n vectors from v1 to vn, where m is bigger than n, then the vectors w1 up to wm must be linearly dependent. That is, more vectors, the span of more vector, um, more vectors fitting in the span of fewer vectors means those more vectors are linearly dependent on one another. There's some way of writing one in terms of the other. 
as we knew before, if any of the elements are zero for some index, then they're linearly dependent and we're done. So let's assume that this is not true. Let's consider another case. We have the w1 is in the span of each of them. So we can write w1 as a sum of uh, each of the vj's for some scalars aj scaling each of the vj's. And not all the scalars vanish. So if you relabel them, you let a1 not being equal to 0. So you have a w1 is equal to a1 v1 plus the rest of the vectors. So you can rewrite v1 in terms of w1 and the rest of them in the sense that v1 is equal to a1 inverse w1 minus blah, blah, blah. One way of thinking about that is by moving this term to the left and then moving this term to the right and then dividing out the uh, minus a1 term. You then see that the, uh, that the span of v1 to vn is the same as the span from w1 to wn. Then, since you can write w2 is in the span of v1 to vn, and we've already shown that that's the same as the span from w1 up to vn, then you can write w2 as a linear combination of w1 up to vn, so you can write w2 is equal to v1 w1 plus another large sum for some scalars vj, not all of which vanish. If you let v1 non-zero, but you let bj equal to zero for some of these, then you have already shown that w1 and w2 are linearly dependent. That is, if this term is completely zero, of all the bj's are zero, then you have your linear dependence and you're done with the proof. So let's assume that this is not the, uh, so if they're linearly dependent, then all the vectors are linearly dependent, because if any two are linearly dependent, then a larger set will still be linear dependent. So let's assume that some of the bj's are non-zero in this larger sum, so you can relabel the vectors uh, vj up uh, in such a way that you make the coefficient that is non-zero being the second coefficient. And by the exact same argument as before, you can make this sum, this span, which is equal to the span of this one. You can substitute in v2. You can replace it with w2 once you do your relabeling. So you get this span. Then you can do the, uh, this argument up to n times. So either eventually you get the set of these vectors as linear independent by having some um, some of the remaining v vectors be have coefficients of zero, in which case you have linear dependence uh, on the w vectors, or that is not the case. And you get that the span of this is exactly the span of this. But we have that m is bigger than n. That is, you have more w's than v's. So you're out of v's to replace in this spanning argument. So since w uh, n plus 1 is going to be in the span of this and the span of this by supposition, because we said all m are in the span of this, and the span of this equals the span of this, then it follows that wn plus 1 is in the span of this. So it follows that there is some way of writing it like this. And consequently, you have linear dependence, because you can just rearrange this to get an equation for 0. Therefore, since you've already proven that n plus 1 is uh, linear dependent on the rest, then the set of all vectors is linear dependent, because you can just put zeros on the remaining terms from n plus 1 up to m, I'm sorry, from n plus 2 up to m, you can just put zeros in front of them and you have your linear dependent for that set of vectors, so you're done with the proof. Finally, let's take a brief idea into finite dimensionality of a vector space, which is very related to the idea of a basis or a spanning set in the following way. A vector space V is finite dimensional if it is a span of finitely many vectors, that if is that is, if v is equal to the span of v1 up to vn for some finite list of vectors v1 to vn, where n is a natural number. If these vectors are not linearly independent, then you can uh, delete at least one of these vectors, and you can do this until the remaining vectors are linearly independent. Therefore, if you have a... Um, therefore, any finite dimensional vector space can be written as the span of a finite set of linearly independent vectors, which you call a basis for that vector space. That is, you've already shown, so by definition, V is finite dimensional, so it's the span of finitely many vectors, but those vectors need not be, uh, need not be linearly independent. That is, if you consider a line, it is clearly spanned minimally by one vector, but if you have more than one vector, for instance, a vector and two, uh, twice that vector, then twice that vector will, then that set is uh, finite and spans it, so your line is finite dimensional. However, that's not linearly independent. And it's usually useful to make a minimally, uh, a minimal spanning set, which you call a basis. That is the fewest number of vectors necessary to span all of uh, v1 to vn.
We call this a basis, and it is an immediate consequence of the theorem we just proved, namely the basis theorem, that the number of vectors in a basis is the same for all bases of a, a given vector space. That is, if you have a set of w1 up to wm and v1 up to vn as two different bases for a vector space, noting that a basis is a linearly independent spanning set, um, then we have the w1 up to wn is within the span of this, since they are elements within the vector space v and the vector space v is spanned by this. So, um, and these must be linearly independent uh, since they're basis. Uh, they have to be linearly independent since they're basis. But then the basis theorem shows that m is less than or equal to n, because if they are, uh, they, if they were linearly, if they were bigger than m n, then they'd be linearly dependent. So they're not linearly dependent. So they're linearly independent. So m has to be less than or equal to n. And then you just swap the roles of v and w, and you get that n is less than or equal to m. So you show that um, n is less than or equal to m, so you show that n equals m. Therefore, the number of vectors in a basis of a vector space uh, is the same for all bases you write for a vector space, which is, again, the minimal linear independ linearly independent spanning set of a vector space. And this number, since it doesn't matter what basis you choose, is invariant to choice of basis, so you call it the dimension of that vector space. And one way of noting this is that a vector space of v having dimension n is indicated by writing dim of v is equal to n. And with that, we'll continue next time by proving an important theorem regarding quotient spaces in uh, vector spaces. Thank you for watching.